live from Los Angeles, it's theCUBE, covering Open Source Summit North America 2017. Brought to you by the Linux Foundation and Red Hat. Hey, welcome back everyone, live here in LA for theCUBE's exclusive coverage of the Linux Foundation's Open Source Summit North America. I'm John Furrier with Stu Miniman. Our next guest is Aaron Welch, who's the co-founder and head of product at Packet. Um, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. Uh, innovation's here. booming, you're a product guy, so I'd love to have that product founder perspective <laughs> of you know, the collision between open source accelerating at a massive scale, not just in the classic sense of all the normal projects that are getting, getting more and more derivative projects, but new projects. You get the, you know, the, the hyperledger, you got IOT, you got a, a massive amount of collision going on between software and you know, your world is about hosting all that and making sure it's on-premise support with low latency and multi-cloud architectures. So there's an architectural battle happening while open source is massively accelerating. Yeah. What's your take and reaction to all that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty interesting and I think especially with the sort of advent of you know, containers on the scale that we're now currently seeing them, obviously that's, that's a technology that's been around for quite a while, but I think Docker finally fixed the user experience side of that and made it comfortable for developers to deploy on. And so now all of a sudden you're, you have a sort of portability on the application level that the cloud sort of always promised, but didn't ever really deliver. You know, you never really ran a AWS instance image on GCE, for example, right? You never had that real portability, uh, especially across clouds or across facilities. Um, but now with the advent of containers, your, both your development pipeline and your CI CD pipeline, once you've obviously made the investment to get that all running properly, is so much more accelerated and so much more uh, isolated from and doesn't rely so much on sort of the traditional infrastructure gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that development cycle is, is accelerating in that regard, but also it's enabled people to get um, sort of come full circle and now you have the ability to deploy your workload on specialized hardware and, and target that specifically, right? So we've, we're going from a sort of like very abstracted cloud environment where it's a certain amount of RAM and CPU, you don't even necessarily know your clock speed, to I want to push my SSL offload to my network card and people are able to do that. So yeah. that's, you know, that's an interesting sort of thing over the last, I would say, three So Aaron, I, I want you to take us back to sure. founding, the, uh, the founding of Packet. Sure. You know, what was, you know, why would we what, start what a was it going? I mean, we look at, <laughs> technology is changing so yeah. fast. You know, we're talking about containers. Uh, yeah. You know, heck, you're in New York City. We're going to probably be there. Serverless conference is going to be yep. there. Amazon's pushing yep. the next generation. There's always the new, 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 new thing. Yep. And there's companies that come out with the new, but the big guys are also jumping all over it. So, you know, where do you guys fit? You know, what, what, what was the impetus for the, for the start. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, it was an interesting time. Um, you know, we, and uh, most of the people when we're starting the company were like, are you completely out of your minds? Why would you start, you know, the, that game's been won, the cloud game is over, you know, AWS has taken the prize. <laughs> what, what are you doing even getting into that space? But, it, but you know, uh, around that time, 2014, um, was when sort of Docker was coming out. Kubernetes was really shortly after we sort of started the company and we felt like there was um, a real value around the economics and performance of dedicated bare metal hardware that just wasn't accessible by people who had cloud native workload requirements. But with the advent of containers, now all of a sudden they, they could do that. And you know, we, we really felt like there was a, a gap in the space where all of those big players are still virtualized. They're still co-tenant, they're still you know, using a hypervisor, and so if you're running your workload in containers, you're paying a virtualization tax, you're paying for co-tenancy, you're paying for noisy neighbors, you're paying for generally poor shared network. Um, and so there wasn't anywhere in that space for people who are either on premise or in a dedicated environment that wanted to move to a more nimble cloud uh, infrastructure and vice versa. People that were getting pinched on the higher end of the economics and paying for poor performance in a virtualized public cloud, wanting to go the other direction, but not wanting to give up all of the flexibility and tooling that they'd invested so much in. So being able to actually automate bare metal, give that experience of the cloud with the performance and economics of, of dedicated servers was something that was missing. So. Yeah. Aaron, take us inside the customer viewpoint here sure. because I've been looking at surveys and they say, you know, how much are they deploying uh, things 
things like we used to talk past, things like Cloud Foundry, uh, you know, containers, Kubernetes, you know, MesosCon's going on here this week. Yep, yep. You know, lots of companies that are using it, but you know, from a production standpoint, you know, the data's still a little bit muddy. What are you hearing from customers? Where are they with that kind of you know, cloud native, if you will, or kind of application modernization? Uh, and do, is that a necessity to leverage your offerings uh, because I guess I look at most companies and say, oh, I've got thousands of applications. I've got some that I'm doing new stuff with, but I got a whole lot of stuff that I need to do something with and a there's whole lot of old lift and workload, shift or yeah. re-platform <laughs> it or yep. anything like that. So how, how does that whole you know, maturity fit into your picture? Yeah, for us, we're, um, we're very agnostic. So we really focus on sort of automating that fundamental infrastructure. So we have plenty of people that are bringing their own hypervisor and mm -hmm. standing up their own sort of traditional virtual clouds using KVM or Xen or VMware. Um, we have people deploying OpenStack on our platform. Um, but I but I feel I definitely feel like in the industry in general, the excitement and the inertia is definitely behind containers. I would say it's still very early. I think most large enterprises that have a cloud transformation uh, strategy or initiative internally that have their own team are still in the proof of concept phase right now. You know, they're still playing around with it. I think it's probably going to be a couple of years before they're really deploying serious workload. But I do think that sort of there's a, there's a, a large but still I would say mid-level enterprise who are paying consulting agencies to boot them into a microservices framework using Kubernetes and Docker and those other, those other frameworks. So still spending real money, still doing it, but are you know, paying some of the kind of leading edge pro-serve firms to do it for them at this point. And then of course there's just, I think, massive amounts of just development and experimentation on the sort of individual developer front. Eric, talk about the impact of Amazon Web Services because we're seeing a lot of workloads certainly going there. Yeah. Um, Stu and I have commented that kind of, well I've commented, I won't speak to Stu, all roads lead to the cloud. Yep. Eventually. Yep. Because I mean, as startups start companies, we are all in the cloud. No one starts a data center and says, I'm going to spend all this CapEx. They might have an operating model at some point, realize something on-prem needs to be there. So you have that kind of mindset. A lot of hybrid going on, which yep. is basically true private cloud, as Stu points out. Your thoughts on, on this trend. How much of, of that debate of Amazon workloads being real vis-a-vis um, -vis their competitors and on-prem. What's really happening in terms of the, the trends? Um, are, is Amazon running a lot of workloads? And what kind of workloads? And where's the on-prem gateway to the cloud happening? Or do you even agree with that? Oh, well, I mean, I think without question, I mean, Amazon is the, is, has been validated by the market, right? They're running plenty of production workload, absolutely. I think that their um, strategy of sort of having a diaspora of supporting sort of hosted services has, has served them very well. You know, I think EBS and obviously um, their object store S3 has been like fantastically successful in keeping that revenue sticky. Um, so I don't really, I don't hear anybody debating that anymore. What the debate, in my opinion, is much more like, how fast and is the Colo world going away? And you know the numbers show it's still growing, right? Um, data center providers are still building, building more data centers. You know people are still selling more Colo. Um, so the question is, is the is that new workload that's going into those sort of you know on-prem or physical data center locations that aren't necessarily on a cloud provider? Is that hybrid workload? You know, I think, I think most people at this point e either have something running in Amazon or one of the other cloud providers, um, and either that's fine and they're going to expand there or, yeah. you know, on-prem, um, or have a DR strategy or, or something, but I think most people aren't um, going to put all their eggs in one basket. Uh, right, so you one, agree Amazon yeah. is definitely kicking ass. Yeah, They're absolutely. Check, check yeah. The box now. Okay, get yep. your thoughts on architecture. So the things that we're seeing a lot of practitioners doing is saying, okay, look, I got to protect my jewels. I got to get my own house in order, which is usually their on-prem situation. Yeah, yeah. And changing their operating model. At the same time, the, you mentioned the virtualization tax. Yeah. There's still the aspect of, I still want to run software defined something. Yeah. That's either servers, hyper-converged, as Stu has talked about many times. Yeah. A lot of that, they look at the a new architecture. Yeah. What are some of the new cool reference architectures that you see emerging that give the enterprise a great solution to maybe take baby steps to the cloud? Maybe certainly bursting is in the cloud. We see that a lot. Uh, maybe some production workloads make sense there. We've seen that too, but there's still the legacy enterprises. Yeah, it's What's tough. What's the preferred architecture? Yeah, it's tough. I mean, for those legacy, I mean, the, the problem with most, most of those monolithic applications is that they're so bespoke that it's pretty difficult to kind of, you know, 
say this is this is your so this is going to solve all your problems, right? And a lot of times these the, the special you know in the container world they 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 cause a lot of problems that you may not even be aware of, right? Like especially in the security space, all of a sudden that perimeter is disappearing, right? Like your services move around, they're dynamic. So I mean I don't I don't know if there is a reference architecture at least that I see that's sort of coming out as what a your standard. Clients do? Well, like I said, you know, our clients are kind of all over the place. We have people that are running containers directly on the bare metal. Um, I think that Kubernetes is probably the, you know, leader in the, at least the orchestration space. Um, I think, uh, but there is still a lot of workload that is that is just virtualized. Um, I think also there's, you know, there are some interesting kind of like. Uh, I don't know, dark horses out there in the in the virtualized container space, like Hyper. So these super super lightweight actual virtual machines um, that that behave uh, similarly to containers and sort of have you know are compatible with the Docker API, but they actually provide the um, the isolation that true VMs do. So I don't know exactly where that is going to fall out. Um, and the other kind of piece that's floating around out out there is all the serverless. Right, I think you, eventually you're going to see people that are literally just deploying functions to the cloud, and those functions are likely going to be deployed into some edge compute network of some sort, um, and they're going to be used absolutely for things like IoT, uh, smart cars, I mean, anything that has you know, requirements where you have to have a response time of 100 milliseconds or less, um, and you're deployed in major metro areas. Um, so you know, it's just extraordinarily disruptive, and I, and you know, when I, when I, when I, when I speak a lot at some of these, you know, events, and that's the question is like, so what tool should we use? Yeah. Like, what should we There's do? No silver bullet. There is no silver bullet, and quite frankly, it's still the wild west out yeah. there. Like, there is no lamp stack equivalent mm -hmm. for the container space right now, and I, I think that will eventually happen. Um, but I think we're a little bit away from that. Yes, Aaron, one of the things I think we've, we've seen, the maturation of Kubernetes has yeah. happened pretty fast. Yes. One of the announcements this week was the Kubernetes certified solution providers yep. um, trying to make sure where do I get it? Is it, you know, uh, got open, in, in OpenStack we used to be, is it pure, is it forked? It's, <laughs> right. well yeah, do, do you have a solution that doesn't work in for Kubernetes? Yep. It, does it actually give me that portability that you talked about? Yep. What are you seeing in the Kubernetes community? What would you like to see even more? We've, you know, watched this kind of tsunami come. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, w w w what's good, where are the customers? Uh, and, and I'd love to follow up on some of the serverless stuff. Yeah, too, absolutely. But, I mean, you know. I think that it's great that the certification program is coming out and like kudos for the CNCF to kind of get that rolling, I think it needs a lot of work. Um, I think any time you put a certification program together like that, uh, especially when you're starting and the technology is so volatile, um, you run the risk of it being a waste of time and or irrelevant. Um, so, you know, I think that the Kubernetes project in general needs to look at some sort of long-term non-breaking releases. I mean, I think, I think right now it's still pretty dangerous um, <laughs> for you to deploy anything like serious on it, even though I know that there are definitely people that are doing that. But those are always early adopters and they know they're going to probably have to pay the price. But, but uh, Google, yeah. Google does it, so, you know. <laughs> Google has some resources that a lot of people don't. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, like, like Google does a lot of things a lot of people yeah. don't do. They got a um, closet and that, of goodness they can just sure. Bring and out. you can either be you can and you can be fine with that and still be successful with that. You just should be aware that you're going to have to pay that price in terms of resources and potential downtime and breaking changes and whatnot. But I think for for widespread adoption, especially in the enterprise, there has to be a certain roadmap and a certain amount of security there to to feel like you're you're going to be you know you're not going to lose your job for deploying something right. Yeah. Well, my big thing that I look at, Stu and I look at, is that the True Private Cloud report that Wikibon put out recently is getting a lot of traction. Certainly at VMworld, a couple weeks ago, was, it went viral, and that was the revelation. And um, I've been having a lot of debates with the Amazon folks here. I'm not trying to say Amazon's not winning. They're blowing it away, and there's a zillion workloads moving to the cloud. But certain enterprise for the bespoke applications and many more other reasons of legacy baggage that they just aren't moving as fast. So they're doing a lot yep. of retro on-site, op changing their operating model, which Take some time. Yep. Then they kind of move to the cloud as quick as possible where they can. So that seems to be the trend. So with that in mind, you're starting to see people jockeying for position. We saw um, Pivotal launch the Kubernetes uh, Container Service, or KPI, the Pivotal Container Initiative, which is tied to Google Engine. Is that real? I mean, because now <laughs> you, have, you have a lot of different yeah. things happening. Like, I mean, it's so confusing. Yep. You got Docker, now you got Pivotal. But Pivotal's got some cred, VMware's involved, and you're tied to Google Cloud Engine. 
making the management easier. Sounds good on paper, what's the reality? Everyone has their own Docker solution, right? And some of those are more <laughs> bolted on than others. Uh, you know, I think you saw, you know, Mesosphere with their DCOS. I think you see, you know, Docker appearing in, you know, Canonical and even Suzy over here has something that I hadn't seen before. You know, everybody wants to kind of get on that Docker bandwagon and some of that is more native than others. Um, so it, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's got to work. It's got to be. It's got to be manageable. It's got to be manageable, and I think that's right. I think in the end, um, you know, <laughs> operational reliability is what's going to win and lose, right? I mean, and the bottom line is a lot of those foundational technologies are quite old, um, and it's all about having visibility into your stack, being able to troubleshoot it quickly, being able to deploy it seamlessly, being able to truly segment your, you know, sort of if you're really going that full DevOps, you know mode, giving your developers the freedom and nimbleness that they want, and making sure that the you know, <laughs> DevOps and traditional security teams have the, you know, the good warm fuzzy feeling that, that everything isn't out of control. Um, and so whatever that is in terms of integrated you know, CI CD pipeline, you know, virus scanning, security so integration. So this is a classic case of the better mousetrap will win. Yeah, exactly, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Final yeah. question I have to ask you. I look in your bio and it says something about fire eating, so uh, yeah. how, how do I you? I didn't bring any of my so, fire so, eating so, equipment. So, so Aaron, <laughs> how, how do you make some of this bleeding edge technology safe so the customers aren't you know, feeling like they yeah. have to eat fire? Yeah, get yeah. burned. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that, I think, um, it's a it's a really good question. I mean, I, I think with anything, it's you know it's important, especially if you're if you're deconstructing a monolithic application, is really try and find those pieces that are that are safe and easy to carve out and use those as a little skunk works internally and really put it through its paces. I think um, I don't think I'm breaking any NDA or anything, but I went to a very great event at Moody's a number of weeks ago, and they did basically an internal all day um, summit. Um, they have a cloud for transformation um, project that's running there that's going very well. Um, and they did something fantastic where they invited the entire company and they, had, they did basically a day long camp um, just internally and they invited a bunch of people out of the space to just come in and inform everyone and, and making sure that everybody sort of understood what the ramifications were, give them an opportunity to learn. And it was really clear that from the very top there was, was buy-in around making sure that this works and making sure that people have the tools and that those teams you know, trust each other and understand what's happening as much as possible before moving into, into something that they may not fully understand. So it really was yeah. kind of a kumbaya messaging gathering to get people on the same page. Yeah. Cross pollinating ideas, yeah, testing, and they, getting feedback. Yep, they ran multiple tracks and so you could go talk, you know, they, they brought in um, experts from various uh, you know, areas of the, of the field and gave their staff opportunities yeah. to ask questions. Um, and which so they didn't jam it down their throat. It was, really nope. more of open it, it, was, it was open policy and it was really great. They streamed everything so people that were work, working yeah. remotely could watch it and they had a really fantastic turnout. I think they had, you know, they had many hundreds of employees to sort of well, Aaron, take the day. Thanks for coming on theCUBE, appreciate yeah. it. Congratulations, you've been three years as co-founder. I know it's a, it's a battle to have to do your own startup. You're a warrior, <laughs> great to see you on theCUBE. Thanks for coming on, sharing your perspective. Absolutely. Always love to have the entrepreneurial perspective. Here on theCUBE at Open Source Summit North America, Linux Foundation, I'm John Furrier, Stu Miniman. More coverage after this short break. <laughs>